Amen. All right, well, we're there in uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 16. And of course, um, I'm preaching through a series on Sunday mornings called Mixing Politics and Religion. And the reason that you're not supposed to mix politics and religion is because everybody gets offended. And, uh, but we, you know, that's what we do here. And uh, we just preach the truth and let people get offended. Um, but uh, this morning, I'm, I'm, we're continuing this series. And of course, this morning, I'm preaching on the subject of uh, uh, the sermon is entitled Injustice for All. And I'm preaching on the subject uh, about the court systems in America, uh, primarily the Supreme Court, but not only the Supreme Court, other courts, federal courts, state courts, state Supreme Courts. And I'm preaching on the subject of the court systems. And this sermon, probably out of all the sermons, is going to be the most um, teachy as far as uh, historical or just government system structure. Um, I'm going to have to, in order to teach you what the Bible teaches about this, I'm going to have to do what the public school failed to do, was to teach you properly about government. Uh, so I would encourage you to write some notes down, and of course there's a place for you to take notes on the back of the course of the week. And honestly, write some of these things down, because some of these things you may have never heard before, and, um, but, but uh, it's going to come straight out of the Bible, and the things that have to do with the government are going to be accurate. You can fact check me. And uh, you can, uh, and I would encourage you to do those things. I'm preaching on the subject of the Supreme Court. I thought it was interesting. I uh, I, I scheduled this series uh, for this time leading up to the election um, many months ago, about before the summer uh, of this year. And I went through and I scheduled every sermon. Uh, for the weeks. I knew which, you know, which sermon I'd be preaching on which week. And this sermon on the Supreme Court was scheduled for this week, uh, you know, months and months ago. I just think it was interesting um, that when I scheduled it, I didn't know this. I think God knew this. But the interesting thing is that this week, there has been a nomination for the Supreme Court uh, all over the news, you know. And this uh, Judge Amy Barrett, I think her name is, has been uh, going through the nomination for the Supreme Court. So I just thought it was interesting how God worked that out. He wanted me to preach on the Supreme Court when it's all over the news. Uh, so maybe that'll, uh, that's, you know, I didn't orchestrate that, but God must have orchestrated that. Uh, but I want to begin just by way of introduction um, to explain the fact that um, judges and the systems of judges is actually a scriptural concept. The concept of having a judge judge the people, is something that is found in Scripture. Deuteronomy 16, if you would. Of course, Deuteronomy is, is one of those books that gives us the law of the land for the nation of Israel, and there's a lot of different things that are uh, dealt with in this chapter. But in uh, verse 18, he actually explains that they should be setting up judges. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18, the Bible says this, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So notice that God told them, I want you to set up judges to judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift for a uh, gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of, righteous, uh, of the righteous. So obviously he's giving some rules here. He's saying, look, I want you to set up judges, but you can't give gifts to your judge. All right. Um, you can't, you know, try to manipulate them, um, you know, and try to get them to rule in your favor. He says they have to just, they have to uh, give just judgment. Notice verse 20, that which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So notice that judges were actually put in place by God in the nation of Israel. And I want you to keep your place there in Deuteronomy because we're going to come right back to it, Deuteronomy 16. But go with me to the book of Luke in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And, you know, another proof of the fact that God instituted judges is that there's an entire book in the Bible called the book of Judges. And you've got the judges who are ruling the nation of Israel, and they are fulfilling this role that God talks about here in Deuteronomy 16. And, of course, um, you, you had different types of judges throughout the Bible uh, as well. With that said, judges are scriptural, and the concept of judges are scriptural. Uh, what we need to understand is that unjust judges have always existed. Unjust judges have always been. And it's interesting to me because um, Jesus actually brings this up in Luke chapter 18. Now, Luke chapter 18 is a parable and uh, the primary application of the parable, the purpose of the parable, is to teach on 
uh, prayer. And I want you to understand that. Luke chapter 18 is a parable on prayer. In the parable, he uses the example of a judge. And he uses the example of an unjust judge. Luke chapter 18, look at verse 1. The Bible says this, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So the, the, the parable is about prayer. Notice verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge, notice, which feared not God, so he was not afraid, he did not show reverence or respect to God. There was a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. The word regard means to consider or to care about. He says there was this judge, he didn't fear God, and he did not regard man. And you know, Jesus in his parables would often use uh, 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 examples that the people were familiar with. He would give examples of a farmer. He would give examples of, of, of someone going on a journey. He'd be, give an example of somebody working on a field. And here he gives an example of an unjust judge because I think the truth of the matter is that we're all familiar with an unjust judge. And look, it wasn't just in Bible times. Today, there are unjust judges all the way from the Supreme Court down through the federal court system, the state court system. Our country is filled with judges which fear not God, neither regard men, uh, who are just doing whatever they want. And I want to expose the uh, Supreme Court specifically today. But again, like I said, we're, we're going to talk about different court systems and I, I want to explain to you what's wrong with the Supreme Court system today because the way that the Supreme Court is being run today is not how it was originally intended to be ran. The way that the Supreme Court is being run today and the rules that are coming, the laws that are coming, the judgments that are coming out of the Supreme Court are not the way that it was meant to be uh, uh, done by the Constitution and our founding fathers. And again, I'm not big on the Constitution and founding fathers. You know, I'm, I'm big on Christianity, all right? But, um, you know, for those of you that love uh, the Constitution, let me uh, help you with something. The Supreme Court is not following the Constitution. And I'm going to give you some reasons for that and explain that to you uh, this morning. Let me give you some points. They're a little bit wordy, so I'll repeat them several times, and you can write them down. You say, what's wrong with the Supreme Court? And how is it not following the Constitution? Number one, the Supreme Court, and, and realize we're in the middle of a series on political matters. You know, if you're here this morning, you think it's kind of random, a sermon on the Supreme Court. Well, number one, there's a Supreme Court justice being nominated this week. Uh, you know, I didn't orchestrate that. It's just kind of worked out that way. You know, so it's applicable. But, you know, we've been studying these things, and I would encourage you to go back. If you didn't hear the other sermons that I preached in this series, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to those. What's wrong with the Supreme Court? Number one, the Supreme Court gave itself the power to strike down duly passed laws. The Supreme Court gave itself the power to strike down duly passed laws. This was actually a power that was not intended to be given to the Supreme Court. Court. And this system or this power that it holds today is called judicial review. And I'd like you to go to the book of Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs chapter number 28. Keep your place in Deuteronomy. We're going to come right back to it and go to the book of Proverbs. If you start right in the center of the Bible, you'll uh, have the book of Psalms. Right after Psalms, you have the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 28. And look at verse number four. The Supreme Court, you say, what's the problem with the Supreme Court today and with the court system in the United States of America? A problem is that it gave itself the power to strike down duly passed laws. You say, well, isn't that something that it's allowed to do uh, uh, based off the Constitution? And the answer is no. Uh, I'm going to read to you several, from several articles and different things. Um, uh, let me read this to you. This is from the uscourts.gov. Uh, this is a federal website. And here's what they say regarding the judicial review power of the court. They said this, the best known power of the Supreme Court is judicial review, the ability of the court to declare a legislative or executive act in violation of the Constitution. So they said the best known power the Supreme Court has today is the power known as judicial review, which is their ability to look at an, a law made by the legislator or an action taken by the executive, by the president uh, or a governor, and to say, no, you're in violation of the Constitution, uh, and, and to strike it down. There, here's what they said. This power is not found within the text of the Constitution itself. The court 
established this doctrine in the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. So, you know, in 1776, this, this, this country was fought for and founded or whatever. And in 1803, this court case, and I'm not going to go into the details of the court case. You can look it up for yourself if you're interested in those things. This court case comes before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court just gives itself the power to strike down and to remove laws that are unconstitutional. Are you there in Proverbs 28? Look at verse number four. Notice what the Bible says, Proverbs 28, verse four. They that forsake the law, and of course the context here is about the law of God, but I want you to just see that there is a general theme here. The Bible says, they that forsake the law, because that's what the, that's what the Supreme Court does today. They look at laws, I'm talking about duly passed laws, laws that were legally passed and enacted by our government, and they look at those laws and they say, nah, and they strike them down and remove them, and this is not a power that was actually given to them. This is a power that they took upon themselves at the Marbury versus Madison uh, 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 case in 1803. The Bible says, they that forsake the law praise the wicked. And let me tell you something, this is something that the Supreme Court is doing today. They choose to forsake the law in order to praise the wicked. They choose to forsake the law in order to uh, help uh, wicked uh, people. Now, let me just kind of explain some of these things to you. And like I said, this is going to be a little uh, more of a thinking uh, concept, not just biblically, but also governmentally. And, you know, by the way, let me just say this. I want to thank Brother Graham, because Brother Graham, uh, he's a lawyer, and he's helped me with some of these things as far as the wording and understanding and making sure that I'm clear. Uh, let me read this to you, uh, just so you kind of understand what, how the Supreme Court was supposed to be ran. Other than original jurisdiction... And original jurisdiction is the term used for a court when it's their, uh, it's within their right to try a case. In the Supreme Court, there are some cases in which they have original jurisdiction, for example, uh, dealing with diplomats and things like that. Other than original jurisdiction, the main power of the U.S. Supreme Court was to review a lower court's decision to answer the question, did the lower court follow the rules? Constitutionality was not a concept before the U.S. Supreme Court. It is hard for us to grasp the idea that constitutionality was beyond the scope of the Supreme Court because that is all they do now. Before, they were simply another appeals court looking to see if the lower courts had failed, uh, overlooked something, or made an error. As the highest appeals court in the land, their job was to determine was the law applied correctly, not to determine should the law be applied at all. So the, the Supreme Court, their job as an appeals court, because of course you go to a lower level courts and it gets appealed to an appeals level court and then eventually it could be appealed to the Supreme Court. Their job is to look at a case and say, okay, here's the law. And by the way, here's the job of a judge to say, here's the law. Has the law been applied correctly? Their job is not to ask the question, is this a law that should even be applied today? That is not the job of the judge. The judge is not supposed to sit there and decide, should we follow this law or not follow this law? The uh, judge is supposed to determine, has the law been passed correctly? You say, well, if that's not their, uh, if that's not their job, because look, it's really a paradigm shift in the minds of most uh, Americans who are actually paying attention to politics. Because we think that the job of the Supreme Court is to tell us, is this law constitutional? We pass the law, and then they tell us, is that constitutional or not? But that's not how the system was meant to be. You say, well, how was it meant to be ran? Let me read this for you. If Congress was invented to make laws, and they were, and it is understood that the Constitution places limits on what laws are allowed, then it would make sense that it should be Congress that decides if a bill is constitutionally acceptable before it comes to law, or before it becomes a law. Do you understand that? You say, oh, well, no, it's the Supreme Court's uh, uh, job to decide whether a law is constitutional. Okay, then, why do we have a Congress? 
The whole point of Congress is we elect these officials to pass laws, and they're supposed to make sure, they're supposed to look at the Constitution and say, well, we can pass this law, we're not allowed to pass this law, we're not allowed to pass this law, we're allowed to do these things, and uh, it's the Congress's job. However, if the people disagree, so if Congress passes a law that people don't agree with, then they have three options. Number one, vote the lawmakers out of office and replace them. That's called accountability. Do you understand that? And I'll bring this up later on in, my ser- in the sermon, but, you know, here's the problem with these judges. They're given a life position, and they cannot be removed. Here's what that means. No accountability. So the options that we, the people, are supposed to have is that we vote the lawmakers out of office and replace the law if we don't like it. We get the executive branch, the president, but also just lower-level law enforcement. Like, for example, we elect the sheriff. Right? So we get the executive branch to simply not enforce the law. If they pass a law that we think is wrong or unconstitutional, we, the, the power of the president is to say, you know, that's fine. You can go ahead and pass that law, but I'm not going to sign it into law. Or if it got signed into law by a previous president, I'm not going to enforce that law. And we can get law enforcement to not enforce the law. Or number three, here's the final check on, uh, on the government is that juries have the power to convict uh, and to give a, a, an answer of not guilty or to acquit. You know that thing you're constantly trying to avoid, jury duty? You know, the reason that juries were put in place is so that we the people would actually be the final check. That people were allowed, that people were supposed to be tried by, uh, uh, by their own peers within their community. And if for whatever reason Congress passed a law that was just wicked, if the president and the law enforcement enforced a law that was wicked, then we as the people, you know, the 12 jurors could say, not only, you know, are we going to judge whether this person is guilty or not, we're not judges. See, judges have to, to look at the law and ask themselves, was the law applied correctly. The jury doesn't have to do that. The jury's not accountable to anybody. The jury's not, uh, the, we the people can uh, put the, the, the person on trial on trial and we can put the law on trial and say this law is a wicked law, it's a wrong law, and we can choose to acquit. That was the balance given in the Constitution. That's how it was supposed to be. But the Supreme Court has given itself the power to strike down duly passed laws called judicial review. You say, I don't think that's that big of a deal. What's the problem with that? I think that's fine. Okay, let me give you some examples that maybe you would care about. And this is an example from the state of California dealing with the California Supreme Court, not the U.S. Supreme Court, just to be clear. In 2000, the state of California had a proposition on its ballot called Proposition 22. Though it was a law enacted by California voters, and by the way, it was passed by California voters stating that marriage was between one man and one woman. And again, I'm I'm not preaching on that subject this morning, and there's lots I can say about that I'm not going to uh, right now. But um, this was a law. And and let me just say this. The way that our system is set up in the state of California is that laws can be passed by majority vote. You can put a proposition on the ballot, people vote, and if it gets a majority vote, then it's passed into law. Legally, that's how we create laws in the state of California. And in 2000, Proposition 22 was put on the ballot, received a majority vote, it went into law, and um, it, we decided, we the people of the state of California, you know, the most liberal state in the union, decided in 2000 that marriage is between one man and one woman. Of course, it went to court, it went to appeals, and it was already understood and, and people saw the handwriting on the, on the wall that the Supreme Court of the state of California was probably going to use its judicial review power, which is not a power that it should even have in the first place, to strike down the law by the, on the basis of saying it's unconstitutional. It goes against the Constitution, the Supreme, uh, the Constitution of the state of California. So this is where the judicial law, look, the people said, we want this law, marriage is between one man and one woman, and the, and the court says, nah, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want. I don't care if you duly passed a law. We're going to decide it's unconstitutional, so we're going to strike it. 
with that knowledge, with that knowledge, proponents of Proposition 22 actually put Proposition 8, commonly referred to as Prop 8, on the ballot in 2008. Proposition 8, known informally as Prop 8, was a California ballot proposition like Proposition 22. Here's the difference. And a state constitutional amendment. It was passed in November 2008. So I want you to look. I know some of you don't care about these things, and I get that. But just think about this. We passed a law saying we're against sodomites getting married. The Supreme Court of the state of California says that's unconstitutional, or at least we knew they were going to say that's unconstitutional, so we're going to strike down that law using a power that we don't even have called judicial review. So in advance to that, or in anticipation of that, the people said, okay, well, if you're going to strike down Prop 22 under the guise of being unconstitutional, then we're going to pass Prop 8 and amend the Constitution. Because if we put it in the Constitution of, the United, uh, of, the, of the California saying we're against gay marriage, then you can't say it's unconstitutional if it's in the Constitution. Prop 8 was put on the ballot. Prop 8 passed. In the state of California, the most liberal state in the union, it passed. We amended the Constitution. And what does the su uh, Supreme Court do? It strikes it down as unconstitutional. Now, hold on a second. You strike down laws as unconstitutional. Then we amend the Constitution to make it constitutional. And you strike down the amendment as unconstitutional. That's illegal. That's wicked. That's wrong. The whole point of an amendment process for the Constitution is so that we can add things, we can remove things, we can say, yeah, you know what, that's not a good idea. Or you know what, that is a good idea. We've added it in the Constitution. So no one can say that's unconstitutional if it's in the Constitution. And they say, no, we're not going to let you amend the Constitution because it's unconstitutional. Even though you have the right, even though people pass laws twice, and what do the judges do? They gave themselves the power to strike down duly passed laws, a duly passed amendment to the Constitution under this, this power of judicial review, which is uh, an unconstitutional power. You know, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the funny part of this. They use an unconstitutional power to strike down constitutional laws and amendments. This is a wicked system because this puts the power in the judge. We can't ever say, we want this law. Well, it's unconstitutional. Okay, let's amend the Constitution. No. We want this law. Well, you, we're not going to let you have that law because it's unconstitutional. Okay, well, let's amend the Constitution. Let's go through the legal process of amending the Constitution to add it in the Constitution so you can't tell us it's unconstitutional. And they just say, no. We don't care what you think. We don't care what you want. We're just going to do what we want. The Supreme Court, you say, why do you think the Supreme Court is wicked? Because it's given itself the power to strike down duly passed laws using a power that was never assigned to it called judicial review. Let me give you a second reason. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 16. So it gave itself the power to strike down laws. And based off the example I gave you with Prop 8 and Prop, Prop 22 and Prop 8, you see how that's a dangerous Thing, power to give the court system because we can't even amend the Constitution. They just, no. So then who decides? They do. They decide. And only they decide. But there's a second problem with the Supreme Court, number two, for those of you taking notes. Not only did the Supreme Court give itself the power to strike down duly passed laws, known as judicial review, the Supreme Court also gave itself power to create laws through non-originalist interpretations of the Constitution. The Supreme Court gave itself power to create law through non-originalist interpretations of the Constitution, and this is commonly known as judicial activism. Now, let me just kind of explain this to you. You go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, and let me explain to you kind of the two camps here. Because if you remember, it is Congress's job to pass law. We have a system, and I'll talk more about it later in the sermon. We have a system that's supposed to have separation of powers. Congress passes law. P president enforces law. 
and judges, you know, apply law or determine if law has been applied. The judges gave themselves the power to basically Congress or the people can pass duly uh, pass laws and they gave themselves the power to say, no. And then they took it a step further and actually gave themselves the power to create laws. You say, well, how do they do that? They do that by using non-originalist interpretations of the Constitution. Let me kind of explain to you the two camps. There's two camps. There's the originalist interpretation of the Constitution, and there's the non-originalist interpretation of the Constitution. The originalist interpretation of the Constitution is basically people who look at the Constitution and they say, well, here's what it says. It, it's, it, you know, it's given the government certain powers. It's given the government certain limits. If the question compared to the Constitution, you know, if a question comes before the court, they look at the Constitution. Does the government have the power to do this? Is it what they're supposed to do? Is the law being applied correctly? You know, they just look at what it says, and then they apply it based off of the original intent written in the Constitution. And people say, well, what if there's something wrong in the Constitution? Well, here's a beautiful thing about the Constitution. It gives you a process to amend it. So if there's something wrong in it, or something that the Founding Fathers didn't foresee 200 years ago, then we, the people, have the power to amend the Constitution and to you know, write in it whatever we want or remove out of it whatever we want. We can fix it if there's a problem with it. The courts have now leaned towards, and not everybody, and I'll say this, not everyone on the Supreme Court does this. You know, there's some people, there's some judges, uh, justices on the Supreme Court that uh, carry and believe in a originalist uh, view of the Constitution. In fact, this Amy Barrett lady, I think she's, she's one of them. But, um, you know, what they've done is they've taken this approach called the living Constitution concept. The living Constitution concept. And the living Constitution concept is this. I'll just read this for you so you can uh, understand it. In the United States Constitutional Interpretation, uh, in, excuse me, in the United States Constitutional Interpretation of the Living Constitution, also known as the Loose Constitution, the claim is made that the Constitution holds a dynamic meaning evolving and adapting to new circumstances without being formally amended. So here's what they mean by that. They mean that they can look at the Constitution and decide, well, this word and this phrase, I think we could make it mean this, and it could mean that. And it's like the original founders didn't write anything in there about you know, how they're applying it. But they're like, but we can make this word, manipulate this word, to make it, you know, give us the power. So instead of amending the Constitution, they just decide to look at the Constitution as a living document. And that's what they call it. It's living document versus originalist view. As a living document that evolves. Let me explain something to you. Nothing evolves. <laughs> Humans don't evolve. Animals don't evolve. And written pieces of paper dead sure don't evolve. But they say, oh, it's a living document, and it evolves with society, and we can kind of make it say whatever we want. Are you there in Deuteronomy 16? It's funny because the Bible actually speaks against this in reference to judges. Remember, we read Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, 19, and 20 when we started the sermon? But I want you to look at verse 19. Notice what God says. The context of this verse is speaking to judges. Here's what it says. Thou shalt not rest judgment. You see the word rest there, W-R-E-S-T? The word, it's, a, it's an older word. It means to distort or manipulate. It comes from the same root word that we get the word wrestle, right? You ever watch two guys wrestle? What are they doing? They're grabbing each other. They're folding themselves over, and they're kind of just trying to get them and manipulating them and moving them to do whatever they want. That's what wrestling is. The Bible says... To God said to judges, thou shalt not rest, or he says, I don't want you to wrestle with judgments. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. See, what the Supreme Court does today is they look at the Constitution and they say, no, no, let's not amend it, like the Constitution actually says. 
Let's just rest. Let's just wrestle. Let's just take the words and manipulate them and move them around and make them say what we want them to say. Now, I'm going to come back to this idea of the living uh, document, but let me, just, let me just say this just uh, as a side note. You know, I take offense to the living constitution concept as a blasphemous concept. Go to the book of 1 Peter, if you would, in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. While you turn there, let me read to you. Uh, this is uh, something written in Ron Paul's book, uh, The Revolution. He, he said this, I sometimes hear the objection that certain phrases in the Constitution give the federal government more power than what is listed in Article 1, Section 8. And that's the article that gives, lists the powers of Congress. Now, isn't our Constitution a living document that evolves in accordance with experience in changing times, as we are so often told? No, a thousand times no. If we feel the need to change our Constitution, we are free to amend it. He goes on to say this, but that is not what the advocates of a so-called living constitution have in mind. They favor a system in which the federal government, and in particular the federal courts, are at liberty, even in the absence of any amendment, to interpret the constitution altogether differently from how it was understood by those who drafted it and those who voted to ratify it. Now here's what's interesting is that today you have many judges and a whole school of thought that says, oh, the Constitution is a living document. You know, I think that's blasphemous because, you know, the Bible actually talks about a book that's living and it's not the Constitution. Are you there in 1 Peter chapter 1? Look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. What's the seed, the incorruptible seed, by the word of God. Notice, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible actually says that God's word is alive. For the word of God is quick, the Bible says. The word quick means alive. It's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the deciding of dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible says that the Bible, the word, there's only one document in this world that is alive. It's not the Constitution. It's the word of God. Amen. What's interesting is that the word of God claims to be alive, and the word of God claims to never change. But they say, no, no, the Constitution is alive and constantly evolving. And what they do is they rest judgment. They take phrases and manipulate them and change them to make them say things that the original writers of those, those laws or constitutions, the people that passed them and ratified them, never meant for it to say Go to the book of Jeremiah, if you would, Jeremiah chapter 1. If you kept your place in Proverbs, I'm not sure if you did or not, but if you kept your place in Proverbs, you have Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah. When you get to Jeremiah, do me a favor, put a ribbon or a bookmark there because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back in that direction in a little bit. Jeremiah chapter 1. And you say, okay, well, what's the big deal with, what's the big deal with them giving themselves the power to create laws based off of the living constitution concept or a non-originalist concept, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal, that you get, they are allowed to make laws and make decisions, strike down laws, or make decisions that basically create laws that were never passed. The laws were never passed. The constitution was never amended. You say, okay, give me an example. I'll give you an example you should care about. Roe versus Wade. I mean, Roe versus Wade basically made abortion legal in this country without a law ever being passed, without the Constitution ever being amended, without the, those who are the electorate or the representatives of those electorates ever making a move just by the judges deciding, just by the judges deciding that, yeah, this means this, so there you go. We decide. You can like it or lump it. We're not accountable to anyone. Now let me just say this. We're obviously anti-abortion. Abortion is murder. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says this, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. 
And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Abortion is wicked, it's murder, it's illegal, it's wrong. You say, well, how, how, did, how, did, how did Roe versus Wade, what happened there? Okay, let me read some things to you as I explain this. Um, you're there in Jeremiah, go to the book of Isaiah if you would. Um, and then I'm going to read a little bit of stuff to you. So go to Isaiah and go to Psalm 94, if you would. Isaiah chapter 10, Psalm 94, and I'll read this for you. Roe versus Wade. I'll give you an explanation of Roe versus Wade for those of you that are not familiar with it. Uh, back in 1973, a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion. So the U.S. Supreme Court, right, these, these people are supposed to be the highest, most intellectual people of the land. I mean, lawyers and, uh, that became judges that are just so smart and intellectual, they understand law. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1973 made a landmark decision. I would say so. It was landmark. Millions of people have been killed as a result of it. A landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protect a preg- protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion. I realize that the average American has never read the Constitution. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you if you've read the Constitution, but let me just explain something to you. I've read the Constitution. Many of you have read the Constitution. It doesn't speak about abortion at all. There's no mention in the Constitution about, well, uh, you know, right there, right after the freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly, there's that right there where you can kill your baby. It's not mentioned. But the Supreme Court says the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion. So we, of course, ask the question, well, how do you figure? Here's what they said. Without excessive government restriction, it struck down many U.S. state and federal abortion laws. In January, it struck down laws that were duly placed. That's judicial review. In January 1973, the Supreme Court issued a 7 to 10 decision ruling that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution provided a right to privacy that protects a pregnant woman's right to choose whether or not to have an abortion. So they say, hey, the Constitution protects a woman's right to have an abortion. So we all ask the question, well, how do you figure that? They said, well, in the 14th Amendment, there's this due process clause that gives uh, uh, the right to privacy. You say, what is that talking about? Let me read to you an explanation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Here's what it says. I'm, I'm actually reading to you the due process clause of the Fourth Amendment, of the 14th Amendment, okay? I'm going li- to read it to you. Listen so you don't miss the part about killing your baby, okay? (laughs) No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge, the word abridge means to diminish, the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Did you get it? You got it, right? The part where you can take a syringe and crush the skull of a child in the womb of a... It was right there! I mean, you didn't see it? It's, 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 it's this game. You know, preachers play the same game. They teach you these doctrines, and they're like, well, the Bible says, and then you read, you're like, where does the Bible say that? Well, you know, if you were as smart as we are, well, you must be pretty smart, because I didn't see anything yet. The 14th Amendment was an amendment that was passed after the Civil War. It was an amendment that was passed that protected prior slaves after the Civil War, when they were given their liberty, stating that no government could create laws that basically kept them down. That's why it reads, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge or diminish the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. They're saying, look, these slaves, they're, state, they're, they're citizens of the United States, these prior slaves, you can't make a law that diminishes their privileges or immunities. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. 
And you say, well, how, how do they justify this? Because they have to, you know, they're supposed to write down these, these briefs that nobody reads, and they're supposed to justify these things. How do they justify it? Here's how they justify it. Two things. First of all, they say that the Constitution gives you a right to privacy, which I'm going to offend some of you libertarians, but I hate, you, I hate to break it to you. The Constitution actually doesn't give you a right to uh, privacy. There's, there's, and what I mean by that is there's actually no, nothing written in the Constitution that says, you know, freedom of assembly, uh, right to bear arms, and then right to privacy. It's actually not there. The idea of right to privacy, that what they say is, well, there's these things in the Constitution that kind of make it seem like the founding fathers wanted to give you a right to privacy. Now, look, I, I'm all for right to privacy. I'm not against right to privacy, I, I'm, but I'm also for being honest. And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say, well, it's right there. You know, the 11th Amendment gives you a right to privacy. It doesn't do that. So, well, where does the right to privacy come? Well, the, they look at stuff that's actually in the Constitution, like, for example, um, where you're not, you know, supposed to be searched without a warrant, where you have the right to remain silent, where the king's not allowed to put his um, British soldiers and quarter them in your house, right? <laughs> Remember that part? So, you know, those, they, they look at these things and they say, you know, it kind of seems like the Constitution has given you a right to privacy, that there's certain things that the government can't do or interfere in your life. And look, I agree with that. I don't have a problem with that. So, say, so because you have the right to privacy, and because the 14th Amendment says that the government cannot create a law which diminishes or deprives any person's life, liberty, or property, then we think you should be able to kill your baby. Say, okay, I'm still not following it. How do you figure? Well, here's how we figure. If you don't want a baby, and a baby's going to cost you money, and a baby's going to limit your ability to prosper and to be happy, then the government can't force you to have that baby. And because the Constitution gives you a right to privacy, you know, the government can't make laws that interfere within the private matters of you and your medical doctor. If you and your medical doctor want to kill your baby, then the government's not allowed to interfere in that because you have a right to privacy and you have a right to be happy. Now, let me just explain to you how hypocritical this is. Here's what the 14th Amendment says. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, of life, liberty, or property. They actually, they actually took the law that says, hey, you can't deprive somebody of life. And then they said, they rested it, they manipulated it, they changed it to say, well, you have the right to take somebody's life. If it means you're going to be inconvenienced. Hey, how about not being a whore? How about not sleeping uh, around if you're not ready to have a baby? Uh, why punish the baby? How about we uh, let the baby live and put them to death? Amen. Amen. Right. And, well, you have a right to life. Yeah, you have a right to life. What about the baby's life? You have a right to not be inconvenienced. And you have a right to privacy. Okay, so if I don't like somebody, can I just, hey, come meet me at my doctor's office. And as long as I, you know, I can take an ax and just whack him in the skull, but as, as long as I did it in the privacy of the doctor, then the government can't. You see how ridiculous that is? And, and, but they, they looked at, look, the founding fathers wrote nothing in the Constitution about abortion. But you know what the Supreme Court does? They rest judgment. They say, well, this word kind of means, and this concept's kind of found, and we kind of think that, yeah, we're going to say, Roe versus Wade, you can't, you know, state of Texas, you can't pass a law against abortions, and because they struck down that law using a power that was never intended for them called uh, judicial review, they created a law which basically said, across the, board, uh, across the board, abortions are legal now. Let me read to you another, another thing in regards to this. The Constitution does not list a right to privacy. The court has held, however, that the Bill of Rights protects protection of freedom of free speech, assembly, and religious exercise, First Amendment, along with the freedom from forced quartering of troops, the Third Amendment, unreasonable searches and seizures, the Fourth Amendment, and forced self-incrimination, the Fifth Amendment, 
creates zones of privacy. And look, and I'm all for the zones of privacy, but I'm not for the zones of privacy when they mean you have the privacy to kill a baby. Create zones of privacy Further, the Ninth Amendment's protection of unreasonable, uh, uh, protection of uh, innumerable rights could be said to protect privacy. These zones uh, the court held are placed into which the government cannot uh, unreasonably intrude. Roe claimed that the law robbed her of her right to privacy as protected by the combination of the Bill of Rights amendments and of her liberty as protected by due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The court agreed with Roe and held that the right to privacy includes the abortion decision. It's wicked. It's, it's, it's wrong. And not only is it wicked as hell, it's actually unconstitutional. It's actually not something uh, that, we're, that, that, that is supposed to happen because the law doesn't even say that. But this is what the Supreme Court does. Let me give you another example. Go to, uh, go to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. I'll give you another example. How about the Affordable uh, Care Act? Obamacare. Obama passed this law, and President Trump... I'll give him the credit. He removed the mandate, you know, which is good. He hasn't removed Obamacare, which he did promise to do, but he removed the mandate. You know, so, hey, I'm fair and balanced. I'll give, him, I'll give the man credit where it's due. But he removed the mandate, but Obama passed this law that basically forced all of us to receive health care. We have to pay for government health care. We have to show that we have health care, and if we don't want health care, you know, then you have to pay for government health care. If you don't want to pay for government health care, then you get fined. And, uh, and, and they passed this law. And, of course, people took this up to the courts and said, hey, this isn't right. This is not uh, constitutional. And here's what the Supreme Court said. They said, because of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, which is where the, the rights or the powers of the government are given, they said this, the Constitution says this, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. He said, the Congress was given power to lay and collect taxes. And because they have the power to collect taxes, therefore that gives them the right to force you to get health care. Now, let me just ask you this. Do you really think the Founding Fathers were envisioning Obamacare when they said, hey, government has the right to lay taxes? Look, and I, I think the government does have the right to lay taxes. Jesus paid taxes. I'm not against paying taxes. But they, they, this is what I mean. They just they take whatever phrase they want. Or how about this one? The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay debt. Why, why, why don't they ever do that part? and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Because look, they're just being descriptive here. Those clauses are adjectives. They're, you're, they're saying, hey, we're giving the, the government power to, uh, to, to charge the people taxes. And you say, well, why do they need to charge taxes? Well, you know, to pay down debt, to provide for the defense, and for the common welfare of the people, just to make sure that things, that they have the money to do what they want to do. So the Supreme Court says, oh, common welfare, common welfare. We get to start a welfare system. I mean, food stamps. I mean, you know, uh, we're going to pay for your babysitter. I mean, we're going to give you food. We're going to do, because it says general welfare. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Brother Graham brought this to my attention. I thought it was interesting. The welfare system was totally unheard of when the Constitution was passed. In fact, the first time that a welfare system mentality came into the public view was during the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt. Why did it take so long? If the, if the founding fathers said general welfare means Food stamps means, you know, uh, Section 8 housing, means public school system, means, uh, you know, uh, health care for everybody. If that's what the phrase meant, why do you take all the way to Franklin Roosevelt? We're talking about World War I, you know, for people, or two, excuse me, for, for people to get this idea like, yeah, we're supposed to have a welfare system. Look, that's not what they meant. And you know it. <laughs> and they know it. But instead, and you say, well, are you against welfare systems? I'm not against welfare systems if they just pass the laws. 
But you know why they won't pass a law? Because if they passed a law saying, hey, we're going to take X amount of money of your dollars and give it to a bunch of bums, you're going to say no. <laughs> so, you know, and look, and you say, well, hey, don't you care about people? You know, people, poor people were cared for throughout this country for hundreds of years before the New Deal, before Franklin Roosevelt. You say, how was it done? It was done the way that God said it should be done. It was done through local churches. Local churches are the ones that are supposed to care for the widows and the uh, fatherless, the orphans. You say, well, I think the government has a better system. You're foolish. The, The church has a better system. You say, why? You know why? Because the church, if it's our job, our church gives. Our church, look, you don't, we don't talk a lot about it. We help. We give benevolence. We help people uh, in need. But you know what? We don't give money to drug addicts. We don't give money to uh, well-abled men who have the ability to work and refuse not to. We actually help people who actually need help because it's called accountability. See, when the government is put in charge of something, no, nobody's in charge of it. They just hand out checks and money and anybody gets it. I'm not saying that orphans shouldn't get help, the fathers shouldn't get help, widows shouldn't get help. I'm not saying that people that aren't sick shouldn't get uh, help, but the government's not supposed to do it. The Bible actually says that the church is supposed to do it. And you know, when people call, people call our church every day asking for money. And you know what I tell people? Uh, what I used to tell people, now I tell Oliver to tell people. People are like, can you help us? I'd be like, yep. You come to church Sunday night and we'll have groceries for you, waiting for you. Hundreds of dollars worth of groceries waiting for you tonight. You show up to church. You know, in 10 years, we've had maybe two people show up. Because you know what they want? They want money, but they don't want accountability. Hey, we'll help you. You come be part of this congregation, we'll take care of you. You come be a part of this congregation, you have a baby, we'll bring you meals. You're in the hospital, we'll help you out. We'll do whatever we can to help you out. We believe it's a call of the church, but you know what? With that call comes accountability. And you can sit there and say, I worship the government, the government does everything right, but let me tell you something, no it doesn't, and you know it. That's why you avoid the DMV. (laughs) Because the government doesn't do things well. But if you allow churches to provide for the health welfare of the people, you know what? We would take the drug addict and said, yeah, I'm going to help you, but we're going to get you off drugs. And we're going to get you a job. And if you don't want to, then you can go starve because the Bible says that if you don't want to work, then you, can, then you shouldn't eat. And that's how it should work. That's how God designed it. And by the way, not only that's how God designed it, that's how our government was uh, created to work. Isaiah chapter 10, look at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. That's the Supreme Court. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. This is like the life verse of the Supreme Court. And and just just so you can see that it's in the context of Judges, verse 2, to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. And, and, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and say this is a sermon for another day. But, you know, the welfare system of this country is actually hurting people. What, what you subsidize, you get more of. And when the government subsidizes, oh, you have another baby without a father? Here's more money. When you reward unwed mothers having baby, when you reward sinful actions, you get more of it. Look, I'm not against moms, single moms. We love single moms at Very Baptist Church. We help single moms at Very Baptist Church. But you know, we also try to teach single moms, hey, stop having kids so you're married. Get married. This is God's design. You'll be happier. You'll be better off. The Supreme Court is a wicked, uh, has turned into a wicked institution because of the fact that it gave itself the power to strike down duly passed laws using judicial review because of the fact that it gave itself the power to create laws using uh, uh, non-originalist interpretations of the Constitution. Let me give you a third one. The Supreme Court positioned itself above the two other branches of government while being accountable to no one. This is judicial totalitarianism. That's what I call it. I coined that case you want to give me credit. But um, here's the actual term for it. Brother Graham gave it to me. It's called 
uh, critarchy, rule by judges. That's actually the country you and I live in today, critarchy. Now look, let me say something. Go to Psalm 94 if you wouldn't. Psalm 94. There's actually nothing wrong with critarchy. The nation of Israel actually had critarchy, the book of Judges. Here's the difference. The judges in the book of Judges were not able to strike down laws or create laws at whim. The laws of God were given to them and they were unchanging. The judges were simply supposed to look at the laws of God and say, yep, yep, you killed someone. I guess we're going to have to stone you. That's what the law says. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with critarchy, what's wrong with the Supreme Court, you know, judging us as monarchs is that they get the power to create laws, strike down laws, so they, they, they're not bound to the law. They change the law at will. And you know what they've created? They've created a, basically a, a, a totalitarian government where we're ruled by these judges. Psalm 94, look at verse 20. Psalm 94, verse 20. Shall the throne, notice the throne here is a reference to like a king, but these judges have put themselves on a throne. That Supreme Court is a throne today. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? Notice, which frameth mischief by a law. Do you see that? The Bible says, hey, be careful about putting people, these people in power who are going to frame mischief by a law. Look, just because something is legal doesn't make it right. Just because abortion is legal doesn't make it right. They might frame mischief by a law, but you know, it's wrong. The Supreme Court has put itself above the other two branches of government uh, while being accountable uh, to no one. Go to the book of Isaiah, if you would, Isaiah 33. And let me just explain a few things to you in regards to this. You say, well, what's the big deal? They strike down laws based off judicial review. They create laws based off their living constitution concept, their you know, uh, non-originalist interpretation of the constitution, based on the fact that they just rest judgment and make the words say whatever they want. What's the big deal with that? The big deal with that is that our government was not created in that sense. And look, I, I need to be clear about these things. And I, I think sometimes I, I try to be too clear and I confuse some of you, and I apologize for that. But you know, that's not how our government was instituted. Me saying that is not an endorsement on our government, okay? Because I actually don't even believe in what I'm about to explain to you, but I'm explaining to you this is how our government was set up. Our government was set up with a concept called separation of powers. Separation of powers. The idea was, because they didn't want a king, right? They didn't want one guy ruling us. So hey, we're going to separate the powers so that no one person, no one branch of government can just control everything. So he said, we're going to set up a Congress, and the Congress is going to pass laws. And we're going to set up a president, the, the legislative branch. He said, we're going to set up a president, the executive branch. The president is going to enforce law. And then we're going to set up judges and a judicial system, and they're going to apply law. And there was checks and balances here. Because the Congress was supposed to pass laws that were constitutional. We're paying them to do that. But just in case they didn't, then the president had the power to say, well, I don't care if you pass the law and a, if a prior president signed it into law, I'm not going to enforce it. That's his power to check their balance, to balance them. And then the court system had the right, just in case the, the, the Congress passed an unconstitutional law, just in case the president enforces an unconstitutional law, then in the jury system, in the judges, uh, in the court system, you have a jury of your peers which can just say, no, we're going to quit you. We're going to find you not guilty. This is a stupid law. We're not going to uphold it. And you had judges there to help with that, making sure that the laws were being applied properly and so forth. That's called separation of power. Now, let me just say something. I don't even believe in that. I, I'm just explaining to you that's how our government was set up. I'll just say this, though. That is not a concept found in the Bible. The Bible does not teach that. And just to give you an illustration of that, remember last week we learned that um, God set up three institutions, the family, the church, and, and uh, government. And all of these are set up as far as their authority in a similar way. Imagine how stupid it would be in a family. Okay, mom gets to make all the rules, but dad is the only one that gets to spank. 
So mom makes the rules, but she doesn't get to spank. I know that's how some of your families are anyway. But uh, that mom makes the rules, but she never spanks. Daddy spanks, you know. So if mom makes a rule that daddy doesn't like, he just doesn't have to enforce it. Mom said, you know, you can't eat your dessert before dinner. But dad doesn't like that because he wants to eat his dessert before dinner. So he's just not going to let you, you know, he's just not going to spank you for it. But you know what? Even if dad wants to spank you, before he can do that, he has to get permission from the two grandparents. The two grandparents have to hear the case, and they have to decide whether you're allowed to spank the kid. You know, that's separation of powers. That's stupid. You understand that? That doesn't even make sense. And you say, well, I'm, I love, God bless America. Okay, whatever. You can, you can like that. I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm not saying we need to get rid of that. I'm just, I'm just saying that's not even a concept found in the Bible. But, but, but with that said, let me say, that is the concept that was created in our country. The judges have bypassed that. They bypassed the, con- the Congress by striking down laws and creating laws. They bypassed the president because, look, today, today, our, uh, you know, the way that our culture is set up, everybody just, you know, uh, uh, just gives their allegiance to the Supreme Court. Everybody just decides, you know, whatever the court wants to do, that's what we're going to do. So the president doesn't ever go against the court. Congress never goes against the court. They just all submit to the authority of the court. So if the court says you can kill babies, the president's like, well, I guess I can't do anything about that. Uh, How about the fact that there's a law against taking somebody's life? Why don't you arrest all these? Why don't you shut down Planned Parenthood and arrest all these abortion doctors? That's actually legal. You could actually do that. You don't need to pass, you don't need a, to pass Judge Amy Barrett in the Supreme Court for you as the President of the United States to quit allowing murder to happen in our country. But you, but, but you know, people, uh, well, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says it's allowed. Everybody has submitted to the Supreme Court. So you know what we have? Instead of having one king, we just have nine called the Supreme Court. They're elected for life. They're not up for election. Nobody can, uh, can remove them from office. Nobody can even lower their pay. They do what they want. It doesn't matter if, you, if we the people pass laws, duly pass laws. Nah, I don't care. Okay, we'll amend the Constitution. Nope, not going to let you do that either. They do what they want. We live under a critarchy. So uh, uh, judicial totalitarianism. The Supreme Court. And look, Please understand this. Go, go to Isaiah 33 and verse 22. And I, I just want to help you guys out with some of these things. And I, I hope this is okay for me to uh, explain this. This doesn't have a lot to do with the Bible, but I just want you to understand this. Because I've been preaching these sermons on politics. And look, please understand something. I don't even care about politics. I, look, you vote for whoever you want. I don't care. It doesn't make a difference to me. I don't care about politics, but you know what? As a Bible preacher, this is something that's on people's minds, so I'm going to preach it. But, you know, I've been preaching these sermons on politics, and then I've been having a lot of people talk to me about it. Here, as I travel, through email, through phone calls, lots of people saying, hey, I love the sermons. Other people saying, no, I don't agree with this or whatever. But, you know, something I've realized as I've talked to people is that most people don't even understand the government in which they live. Let me give you an example. Most people think we live under a democracy. That is not true. You do not live under a democracy. Prove it. Okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the democracy for which it stands. Is that what it says? And to the republic for which it stands. You know, in the United States of America, the government that was instituted in this country is not called a democracy. It's called a republic. Even more than that, we're not just a republic. We are a constitutional republic. Even further than that, we're not just a constitutional republic. We are a representative republic constitutional republic. Now, I don't care about that. But if you care about it, at least take the time to know that. You're going to argue with me and tell me I'm wrong about something. At least know what government you live in. This is not a democracy. Quit saying that. You say, what's the difference between a democracy and, and, and a republic? A democracy is majority rule. A republic is ruled by representatives. Major difference. In fact, the founding fathers were against democracy. Let me, I, there's lots of quotes on this. You can Google them. If you like, I'll just read to you one. Thomas Jefferson. You ever heard of that guy? I think he was pretty involved in you know, creating this government. 
Here's what he said. A democracy is nothing more than mob rule, where 51% of the people may take away the rights of the other 49. Look, that's what Thomas Jefferson said. Ah, well, the the founding fathers created a democracy. You don't know what you're talking about. The word literally means mob rule. Democracy is majority rule. A republic, which is the government you and I live under, is rule by representatives. Now, you know, excuse me if I'm going to confuse you with facts, but please understand this. We do not live under a democracy where we vote and we just, and majority rules and the popular vote wins. That's not the system that was, that's what everybody thinks today. That's how everybody acts today. But that's not the system that you and I were set set up in. We were, because here's the founding fathers, just get this. I'm not even saying I agree with the founding fathers. I'm just explaining to you the system in which you live. The founding fathers did not want a king ruling over us. So they created a government system that had separation of powers. But the founding fathers also did not want the masses ruling us either. So that's why they denied a democracy and they created a representative. Oh, somebody's going to take a picture of that. Good night. <laughs> they created a constitutional representative republic ruled by representatives. Here's what's interesting. When the Constitution was passed, you know, the, 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 there was... I mean, have you ever thought about Congress? Why the Congress is divided into two chambers? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you have the House of Representatives, you have the Senate. Every state gets two senators. Every state gets a certain amount of representatives based on the size of the state. The Congress is supposed to be the representatives of the people, right? Bigger states get more representatives, smaller states get smaller representatives. The way that the Constitution was set up, not the way it is today, the way it was set up was that we the people voted representatives into Congress, into the House of Representatives to represent the people. The way it was originally set up is that the governors selected the two senators that represented the state. You say, why? Because what's best for the state is sometimes not what the mob wants. So they created a system where the people got a say, but the state got a say as well. Now, we've changed that since then. Now we run both houses uh, the same way. We elect senators, which is stupid. We should just get rid of one of them. But that's how it was set up. The governor chose senators who represented the, you know, the, the, the rights of the state or represented um, the, the well-being of the state. The people chose congressmen that represented the rights of the people or the benefit um, of the people. This was a majority rule. By the way, let me just say this. We don't elect presidents. I mean, just please, just if you don't believe me, you're mad at me, you're angry with me, whatever, just study it out. We live under a system called the Electoral College. You do not elect presidents. We choose people who choose the president. We elect people who elect the president. That's why people say, every vote matters. No, it doesn't. (laughs) And I'm not saying that like a conspiracy theorist, like they're going to, you know, uh, cheat. I'm saying that like historically, every vote doesn't matter. Look, if you're a conservative in the state of California, I hate to break it to you, your vote literally does not matter. And I'm not just saying that. If you're a liberal in the state of Texas, your vote doesn't matter. In fact, the only time your vote really matters is if you live in a swing state. You know, I'm sorry to confuse you with facts. Pastor, you got to stop preaching against Trump. He's going to lose California. He's going to lose California anyway. (laughs) It's the Electoral College. We We don't vote for president. You vote for representatives who elect the president. And look, please, and look, I'm I'm, going to piss people off. That's okay. Just relax. All right? Look, look, there's going to be an election soon. This series will be over. We'll move on to something else. All right? This too shall pass. Okay? (laughs) But people get mad at me. They're like, they get mad at me for preaching against Trump. And you know what? Let me break something to you. Verity Baptist Church is not a democracy. It's not up for debate what I preach about. I preach what I want. I'm the pastor of this church. If you don't like it, you can leave. 
You know, you think, you think, oh, well, you know, we get to tell the politicians. You can tell the I'm not up for election. <laughs> if you don't like it, look, I, and look, by the way, you got to thank God that you have a pastor who's going to preach what he believes is right, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Y'all thank God you don't have a pastor who stands up and goes, oh, 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 well, what do people think? <laughs> I don't care what people think. I don't care what the Bible says. And you know, the Bible says, because some, somebody was yelling at me recently. They sent me, you know, this uh, message, and it was in all caps. So I could tell they were yelling. And here's what they were saying. Quit preaching against Trump. Don't elect people based off character. Based, uh, elect people based off policy. Okay, look, if that's what you believe, that's fine. I don't care about that. I'm just, let me just explain something to you. That's not the system that was set up for our government. You were supposed to elect representatives who represented you in Washington based off their character. The founding fathers, they had this idea that you were busy farming, raising a family, worshiping God. They don't want you to be involved in every little thing of government. So what you and I were supposed to do is we were supposed to choose peers, people we knew that we said, hey, this guy's a solid guy. This guy's a smart guy. This guy, he, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's got some character. We're going to choose him and we're going to let him decide what should be done. That's how the system was created. Look, you, some of you need to just read a book. Turn YouTube off, turn off Alex Jones, turn off Fox News, and pick up a book and read it. Because you want to sit there and tell me, ah, oh, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about this. It's like everything you're telling me is wrong. We're not a democracy. We're a representative constitutional republic. We choose representatives based off their character. And by the way, that part is actually biblical. That's what the Bible says. Remember, we saw in Exodus 18, they chose judges. They chose politicians, princes, based off the fact that they feared the Lord, that they were honest, that they hated covetousness. You elect them based off of their character. I know this is foreign to people, but just bring it to the church. Because remember, God instituted three institutions, the family, the church, and government. Let's talk about the church. Let's say I died and you guys had to choose a new pastor. How does the Bible say you choose the pastor? Well, there's pastoral qualifications. Okay, what are they there for? To show you the character of the man. That he's not a drunk. That he rules his house well. That, he ha- that he's not divorced. Right? You know how you're not supposed to choose a pastor? Say, well, listen, Pastor Jimenez, you know, he used to have a harvest party. Are you going to continue to have a harvest party? <laughs> well, no, I think, well, you know, well, how many pies are you going to bring to the pie social? New pastor? You know, are you going to, you know, he used to give us mugs. Will you give us mugs with coffee in them? I mean, that's how we choose presidents. What are you going to give me? What are you going to do for me? Is that how you're supposed to choose a pastor? No, look, you choose a pastor based off character and let him decide how to run the church. Which is, by the way, why I don't care what you think. And I don't mean that in a rude way. But you understand, that's what the Bible says. You choose, look, you don't choose, wives, you don't choose a husband. Well, how much money are you going to give me every week? And, and, you know, every, you got to agree to every Tuesday and Thursday, you're going to do the dishes. That's not how you choose a husband. You choose a man who's honest, who works hard, who can provide for you. You, ba- you choose leaders based off a of character. You say, why are you against Trump? Because he's greedy. Because he's a liar. Because he's an adulterer. Because he's disqualified himself from leadership. And people, people hear me say that, and they think, oh, you're for Joe Biden. Look, Joe Biden's a pedophile. I'm not, I'm not for any of them. And look, look. Just to tell you what I really think, all right, I hope on election day or the day after election day that the whoremonger Trump gets elected versus the pedophile Joe Biden. I'd rather have a whoremonger than a pedophile, but I'm not going to stand up here and act like he's the man of God. Like he's like some godly, you know, man that, because that's what Baptist preachers are preaching today. Trump was sent by God. Oh, really? He sent an adulterer? He sent someone who's not qualified to lead based off scripture? Say, I don't like that. Well, you can do what you want with it. I'm not up for election. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. And look, and by the way, not, if you say, I don't like that. Okay, well, how about this? That's how our system was set up. A representative constitutional republic. You choose men to represent you in office based off their character, and they pass laws, and there's checks and balances and limits to that system. That's the government you and I live under. And maybe, just maybe, you need to shut off Alex Jones and Fox News. You need to shut off 
that other guy in Montana, I can't think of his name right now, Chuck Baldwin, and actually read the Bible and actually read a, a book. Democracy is ruled by majority. Republics are ruled by representatives. Go to Isaiah 33, we'll finish up. Is everybody completely offended? I just want to make sure I don't leave anybody out. <laughs> if, if you haven't been offended yet in the series, let me know, and I'll make sure to cover it next week. <laughs> Isaiah 33, verse 22. Say, Pastor, you're against everything. I'm not against this. You say, what do you believe in? Uh, God? Well, what do you, how do you think the three branches of government should be ran? Okay, I'll show you. Isaiah 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. That's the judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver. That's the legislative branch. The Lord is our king. That's the executive branch. He will save us. You say, oh, well, you know, the Constitution was founded on the Bible. Oh, really? Because they believed in the separation of the legislative branch and the judicial branch and the executive branch. But here you find them all in one person, the Lord. Look, I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset with you. It's, it's just fun for me. <laughs> and look, I'm not saying that we need to get rid of the system we have. But here, here's all I'm saying. Here's all I've been saying is that I'm not going to sit up here and pretend like the things being done in this country are found in the Bible. They're not. You say, a Amy Barrett, she's, gonna, she's a conservative. Trump's putting her in. What do you think about her? Here's what I think about her. She's a woman. The Bible says that women shouldn't rule over you. I'm sorry to confuse you with the Bible. Now, look, if Amy Barrett becomes a judge and they overturn Roe versus Wade, I'm going to be happy about that. But I'm not going to sit up here and pretend like the Bible says something it doesn't say. Like the Constitution says something it doesn't say. Like our government system was set up in a way that it wasn't. And some of you need to have your minds renewed. And you look, everything I've said, fact check me. Google it. Read a book. You'll find it all to be true. We're not a democracy. We, don't choo we, we choose representatives. This is the way that it was meant to be. And some of you need to just realize that and realize that, you know what? Just a little while to labor, just a little while to wait. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm not a, an American first and a Christian second. I'm a Christian, period. Let everything else go away. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, I realize that these sermons, they, they upset people and, and, and people don't like it. But you know what? They don't like the truth. And Lord, help us to always, this church is called Verity Baptist Church for a reason. We preach the truth. And Lord, help us to just never give in to the pressure to try to just make people happy. And help us to just always preach the truth. And help us to realize that, look, yeah, there are better choices than other choices, but we're not going to sit here and pretend like the Bible is for something it's not. And Lord, I pray you'd give us all the wisdom, give us all the discernment to understand these things. And Lord, in, in areas where we haven't studied out what the Bible says or what the Constitution even says, then help people before they just make decisions, help them to actually study it out and look at what is actually written in these documents, in the only living document, the Word of God, and even the founding documents of our country. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.